Welcome to the Executive Lounge, the business leadership show that brings you nuggets of insights from the experiences of men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of starting, growing and managing businesses across the globe. Today, I'm joined by a man who has had diverse experiences, but now is a lawyer. And he founded his law firm right here in Ghana, but is headquartered in Mauritius and has branches right across the continent. We'll meet my guest in a moment. He is the senior partner of AB and David. David Ofosudote is my guest. My name is Inshira Addo. Welcome, David. Thank you, Inshira. Thank you so much for making time for us. And uh, your story fascinates me. And it's unheard of for businesses to start and spread their wings from within Ghana. We'll get to how you did that. But share with us a bit about who you are. Where did you come from? Uh, I'd like to meet David the boy. Ah, <laughs> my close friends call me the Konongo boy. Uh, I was born in Akuse, uh, actually. Uh, a toddler in Nkoko, uh, sometime uh, faint memories of what Nkoko looked like. And then uh, we moved to Konongo. Uh, my father was a policeman. That should explain right. the, the frequency of movements. So you kept moving inland. So yes, from Akuse, yes. In Koko, and then you fell Konongo, into Konongo. Then we went up to Wa, then Laura, then <laughs> Sekendi, then Isamankesi. I mean, that uh, uh, kind of pattern. Uh, so I did my elementary school uh, in Konongo, uh, basic uh, uh, school, what they call Saito these days, mm -hmm. uh, Konongo Methodist uh, Primary. And then I went to Konongo Presby Middle. Uh, I had passed the then common entrance mm -hmm. in class six, but I was considered too small to go to secondary school because I was about 10 okay. uh, at that time and then my mom died quite early I don't know my mom I mean so, so I mean to, to put it that way so I went to school quite early because uh, probably I was left alone at home uh, or rather they didn't want to leave me alone at home so I started the common entrance again the following year by this time I was in the then middle school form one mm -hmm. uh, and then I passed again and then uh, I was bound for St. Peter's at Nkwetia, but my father got transferred again, and then I ended up in Takrade, and ended up in Fijai Secondary School. So my boys days, Konongo running around, uh, plucking mangoes, and I grew up to find that I was very allergic to mangoes, by the way. I, I, wow. I, I, I'm quite allergic to mangoes. But then in, in the, in the uh, childhood days, I uh, couldn't be bothered about allergy uh, and, and, and all that. So that's how I grew up. Interesting. Then, yeah, secondary school, and then... Uh, here I am today. Do you think that having been able to grow up in different places uh, kind of sparked that interest in starting a business and spawning it right across the continent? Not at all. Uh, at that time, I had no idea I was ever going to be a lawyer to begin with. Right. Uh, initially, medicine was on my mind uh, and it, it intrigued me because there was about only one doctor in the, in, in the town that I recall. And I went to hospital a couple of times, probably for malaria. Uh, and I thought this was an interesting uh, profession, but by the time I was in secondary school, uh, the only thing I could think about was political science and administration. Uh, mm. Law was not even on my radar. Uh, wow. as, as you may know from my background, I studied transportation planning mm -hmm. and became a fellow of the Charter Institute of Transport and Logistics. At a very young age, uh, I was in my 20s, uh, and then I later did a, a master's in public administration, but I worked in the public service. Mm -hmm. uh, Somehow the idea to do law came suddenly, uh, maybe as a result of a dream I had. Uh, and then I just said, that's it, and that's how it started. I uh, sat for the entry exam for law for non-law graduates. Mm -hmm. I got admitted to law school uh, at Makola. You do the professional law course for two years for, because you already have a, 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 a previous degree, qualification, yeah. yes, and then you do the professional for another two years. Uh, that's what I did. And even then, when I finished, uh, it was more initially of a part-time thing for me. And then gradually, it took over. And then now, I don't do the transportation consulting anymore. Yeah. So as senior partner at uh, AB and David, you also are responsible more for infrastructure um, and projects uh, of that nature. Because the main focus of my practice was uh, infrastructure and finance. Those are the main things I really uh, used to do. And I developed quite a huge scale in what we call government business, where mm -hmm. we advise governments uh, on, 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 uh, on reform of policy, which is actually what took me into Africa to begin with. But I, I believe we'll mm -hmm. come to that story as we go along. 
So I focus on infrastructure, construction, design of infrastructure projects, uh, and I'm very much an engineering biased person, maybe because of my background. Mm -hmm. So I, I sit in the middle of engineers, architects, planners all the time, and at times I'm mistaken for one because I speak, <laughs> I speak their language, and, uh, but, but that's where my law uh, comes uh, to the fore. Mm -hmm. I, I, and then it comes with finance because I do quite a lot of project finance work. Because that was my focus, by the time I was handing over the managing partner to the current managing partner, this was 2012, I had become the fulcrum of that practice group. Now it is, it is headed by a different person altogether. Mm -hmm. So they assign work to me when, when work comes in that area. So that's about 40% of my time. Uh, the 60% of my time, I manage the Africa practice and do strategy and business development. That's what takes a lot more of my time. But I still work for clients 40% of the time. Yeah. How did you come to a point where you started a law firm, uh, founded it, and then now you're a senior partner who is giving work by uh, the managing partner and uh, your seniors in, in, this, in the hierarchy, if I could call it that? Well, I, I think nature itself uh, likes things to grow. I, I believe nature abhors anything that doesn't grow. And uh, maybe the firm has an interesting history. We started, my, I didn't start the firm alone. Myself uh, and a, a partner of mine who is in politics. He's actually in the current uh, uh, government. We were later joined by another partner who was in the previous government uh, as well. But the two of them chose to go into politics. Uh, I have always, uh, since 2000, I must say, taken a very apolitical stance. I, I don't believe in party politics, actually, it may surprise you. Uh, I believe that this nation needs some people who are not part of any part political party and are dedicated to the nation irrespective of what. So that, that passion drives me. Mm. So I didn't go into politics. I, I stayed uh, out of politics. And the first table that we used at the firm was borrowed. And when I tell this story, people <laughs> laugh at it, but that's true, we couldn't afford the table. Wow. Uh, yeah, if, even though I did have a previous profession, we had agreed that we were going to contribute to the profession equally and start. So we had a 50% a apiece, for want of a better uh, word, the third person came in. But, then the practice grew, uh, and then it got to the point we developed strategy cycles. So by the time we were starting what we call the third strategy, uh, it had become clear to me that becoming managing partner of the firm anymore was uh, not relevant anymore, and I could do other things. So I handed over to somebody. I, two years later, handed over the practice group as well, the infrastructure practice group to another person, and now I'm a worker. Uh, I just chaired the board. When, when we meet, uh, that's about it. They assign work to me. Uh, when clients write to me, I immediately refer you to them. And the first thing I will do is to reply to the client that this partner or this person will get back to you. I, I'm not in charge of any work at all. How do you think you're able to do this? Because it's not common in our, in our, in our uh, sphere of doing business. And, and those are part of the things I'm very passionate about. I think we have a very wrong cultural an attitudinal mindset, let me put that mm -hmm. for want of a better word, as, as a people. And it's something I preach against very much. And if you preach about something, you ought not to repeat the same thing. So I made a conscious effort to hand over and to let somebody else manage the firm. Because one reason why our businesses don't grow is because, to use the tree language, I am media. I mean, the person thinks this is for me. And the workers also feel this is for him. I mean, recently I had a, a very funny incident, but it depicts the kind of thing that I've been seeing in my organization, mm -hmm. where a young lady had given some work to regarding registering certain IP uh, uh, rights across the continent. Uh, I said, okay. So intellectual property rights? Yes, okay. yes, yes, a, a, across the continent uh, and for a particular task that I thought she was most fit to do, but this person is just about four years at a bar. And she's working on it, very hard working lady. And she comes to me to give me an update. And I said, OK, uh, go ahead. And she goes, but I wasn't waiting for you. I'm just giving you uh, the go ahead. I mean, it, it strikes you for a moment that really, that's what this lady who is just four years at the bar telling me she wasn't waiting for me. But she wasn't so waiting for me. she's taking initiative yes, and yes. ownership. So there are two ways to react to that. One is to be angry mm -hmm. that me, me, Juma, and you are saying you are not waiting for me. <laughs> the other one is to say, but this person is taking initiative. So. If you go back into the traditional cultural setting, you would like to take the thing back. But if you want to grow and become progressive, then you must become redundant. The, the more redundant the founder can be, the bigger the business can grow. That's, that's what it is. I gave a, 
a talk recently at UMB on succession planning. Mm -hmm. And people were amazed at the kind of things I talked about. And I said, I'm not just giving you a lecture. I'm telling you things I do. So, for example, if you come to my organization, one of the things we, as a, as a, as a thought leadership, that we are promoting is that the future great businesses shall not have employees and that everybody shall be an owner. And I'm conscious about it. In, in 2014, for example, we declared ourselves a for happiness enterprise. What that do we, you mean by for happiness? That we don't exist for profit. We exist for happiness. Uh, how is that so? But you, it, you do it simply build means business. that it is only when our staff are happy and our clients are happy that, that we, we make profit. We don't, if, if they are not happy, we don't make profit. It's as simple as that. I think the whole concept of people existing for profit is wrong. It, it, it is that which focus people's mind on greed. Mm. Let me give you a very simple analysis. If you take a typical Western world and somebody says that the company is making profit, on the average, he is saying that a third of all my income goes to expenses, a third of the income goes to staff costs, including salaries, etc., and a third comes to the owners of the business. That third is self-imposed. I am not against it, but the margin of profit that let people get angry, commit suicide, cheat people, do all kinds of unethical things, it's profit margin they determine. Now, if that profit drives you, what drives you is not the happiness of the client who are serving. So we chose to reverse it. And we are not a loss-making organization, we are a profit-making organization. How has that affected the bottom line, though? Positively. Positively. So I, the happier people are, the better they were. Yes. And the happier your clients are, the better they work. So, for example, in the office, we do have, let's say, you have aerobics. Mm -hmm. So, somebody comes and do aerobics instruction. Five o'clock can go and do aerobics and come back to the firm and work. <laughs> I mean, that's part of happiness. And to make it work, we actually set up a life act work committee. And the committee, which no partner sits on the committee, is determined by the the, the, the staff, the average staff, so lawyers and lawyers. And, yes, and, yes. And, yeah. So, they determine the things they need to put in place to make them happy. And they come with the proposals. And if it's good, we implement it. It's as simple as that. So essentially, you've adopted a, a policy that uh, essentially says money is a byproduct of a job well done. And the job well done is when customer is happy, Correct. then you are happy yeah. delivering. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm very committed to that. So when somebody heard that Dubai was uh, appointing a happiness minister, the person actually sent me a test and said, these people are copying you. I say, well, <laughs> at least I'm happy to be a pay setter. But yeah, we are for happiness enterprise. That's a radical uh, approach to do. And, and we are dedicated to it. I, I'm not, everything we talk about, we actually do. We well, take steps to do it. I've known you um, since, I think, 2014, uh, late 2014. And, and you speak with passion and conviction about things. Um, of course, you have a lot of experience. You've seen a lot of things. Let's talk a little bit about your time in the public service. Okay. What was it like? And um, how much of it has inspired you uh, to do things the way you're doing it now? I wish everybody had worked in the public service at the time I was in the public service. Mm -hmm. Now we have a lot of formal organizations emerging. So what is in the public service, which is good, is being replicated. And what is good in the public service is the order, is the systems. What is bad in the public service is that these systems don't work. And it also slows down decision making. So, and when, for example, I went to Gimpa to do a master's in public administration, every single classmate of mine in cohort two, there were about 20 of us, every single classmate of mine, apart from myself and another, a uh, uh, mate of mine, Alex, were from the public sector. And one question I remember Professor Adai asking the first day in class was, why are you doing public uh, administration when you are in the private sector? I said, because the public sector will control the private sector for a very long time, up to about 2030, that's my projection. The only way to profit as a business is to understand the public sector. If you don't understand the public sector, then you don't know how to let your business grow. Because that's how economy is. If you take UK and US, that is the other way around. The private sector controls the public sector, which is where we have to be going. But for now, it's the opposite. But from the, the trajectory of growth at this point, yes. that's where we're at. Yes. So the systems in the public sector are quite good. Training, the opportunities, but it just doesn't work. So if you came to the private sector and you applied those principles, but you made them work and you understood strategy and speed, you have the systems and the things just fall in place. That's, that's the difference between the two. Now, my time in the public service, I, I, and in the public service, I worked under the Minister of Transport. 
City Express Services was where I was initially seconded to. We were recruited, I mean, uh, quite, quite young, uh, running bus services, planning on how movements of people. I worked on projects like how to utilize government services. I got attached at some point to the technical team. We were advising Jerry Rollins of those days, uh, the President Rollins, on how public uh, 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 vehicles were utilized. And I worked with Colonel Sharp on, on some of those projects. Those things gave you deep insights into the waste in the system. I, I, I will never forget, uh, just when I left the public service, I went into consulting for a period, actually. And I was hired under a UN program where we did a mass transportation study. And Dr. Reku Brobe, who uh, uh, Tarzan, That's right. was, uh, was my boss. Tarzan was then the energy policy advisor for the NDC uh, mm -hmm. in those days. So between the period of 92 to way through to about 1994, I worked with him. On, and we worked on projects on how to ensure that we utilized uh, 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 public vehicles to the best, to the extent that some of the policies came up with the, the recommendation that only ministers, deputy ministers, there weren't many deputy ministers in those That's days, true. actually, and chief directors to have official vehicles. We did a count. I remember Dr. Kostibuchu at that time. The whole total number of vehicles the public sector was to have was about 200. But, I mean, five years later, none of these recommendations were implemented. We ended up with quadruple, if not more, times that number. So that's the point I'm making. The systems are there. The structures are clear. It doesn't work. We're going to borrow from your experiences uh, in both public sector and private sector and see if we can postulate some ideas on how we can fix this because it seems that the challenges that existed then uh, probably are more exacerbated now. Oh, so it, it is. And not to cut you, uh, uh, when I did my project with Agimpa, one of the things I looked at was the local government system. system. And I took a painful look at 1959, the first report, post-independence report on local government and embezzlement. And I will challenge you to read the 1959 local government report and read 61 and read all the way to now. And the report on MMDAs and the, that goes to the Public Accounts Committee. You will believe, if you read the 59, you will think you are reading this report in 2012. Well, I've, uh, we'll come to that because I've actually studied uh, the MMDAs from 2004 to 2012. Incidentally, it feels like it's a template. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 the corruption is recycled. Yes, the categories yeah. where the losses are yeah. recorded are exactly yeah. the same, except the quantum keeps this, going yeah. up every year. Yeah. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue and learn more from my guest today, David Ofosudote. He's the uh, senior partner at AB and David. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me and Jira Addo, and uh, we are having a good time with David Ofosudote. He is the senior partner at ABN David. Uh, David, you talked about your experiences in the public sector and the fact that as far back as you would uh, remember your, your research from 1959 to date, not a lot has changed in terms of the wastage. How do you think we can find it. What must we do to change this? I know this question may have been asked since 1959, <laughs> but hopefully we will find something that we, we can work with. I think the question have been, actually has been asked since 1959, but I think the wrong answer has been given all the time and keeps being given. Mm. The wrong answer comes in the form of programs, and there have been quite a lot of reforms in the public sector. There have mm -hmm. been a whole lot of public sector reform from cutting across from financial management to pruning the staff. I mean, between the period 1985-86 to about 1998, under the... <clears throat> Uh, the restructuring that was done. Economic but, recovery uh, program, ERP, PAMSCAD, <laughs> all those. In fact, by the time the PNDC was leaving power, we had come to something called BPEMS. I couldn't even remember My goodness, yes. what, yeah, what the acronym meant. A lot of people lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. A lot of training was done. But you go to the public sector today, and one of the things many people believe is that they don't have capacity. What happened to all this capacity building over the years? So it is a mindset thing, and that's one of the passions I do have that I want to, I talk about everywhere, and we were having this conversation. I spoke about it during the CEO forum recently. It's a mindset of the whole nation which must change. 
the person in the public sector is not different from the person in the private sector. Hmm. Indeed, the person in the private sector who believes he owns 100% of one and who says, we a media, and makes the other people feel alienated, is not different from the person in the public sector who believes that once he's chief director or once he's a director, he's the repository of knowledge, does not look at the young people to innovate, does not involve them in anything, and by the time he's retiring, they know nothing. So as a result, nothing is moving on. And they don't even have the energy to implement the programs of the government. So government after government have good programs, but they don't get implemented. I mean, recently I had occasion to ask one of the uh, ministers of, of MPP, the current government, that how do you expect the public sector to deliver the agenda that you are driving? Now, if you don't involve the entire nation, both public and private, in the agenda delivery, it is not possible to deliver anything. That's, that's how societies, look at societies around the world. Nothing got done without the massive support of everybody. Everyone, yeah. You can't do that by leaving the private sector. Neither can you do that by leaving the public sector. And the mindset change must cut across. So for me, we don't need a project. We need a mindset change. Now, when I say we need a mindset change, what do I mean? Mm -hmm. Mindset constitu I mean, is constituted of components of the mindset. And the most important one, which as much as possible we should focus on in this interview, I mean, or in this discussion, uh, for want of a better word, is the development of a self-confident people. So an identity um, that is not just an ideology, but also a trait. We, we, have, we have a confidence crisis, and we may not be recognizing it, but we definitely do have a confidence crisis. When you have people after people telling you that I am constantly building capacity, you have a confidence crisis because you're always building capacity. And you look at, take a look at the World Bank projects we've done in this nation. Project after project always have a capacity That's building component. It's, it's been there for about 50 years. But is it not the case that people put it there because uh, really the capacity but, has not been but built? But when is capacity built? Look, experience is only experienced without having done the thing and made some mistakes and being bold to do it, you always look to somebody. So we have a confidence crisis. And a confidence crisis, it, it may look like a mundane thing, but let me analyze it mm -hmm. across the broader pers perspective and you will understand why. Why do we have so many people flocking to prophets? Because human beings by nature must hope. They must have something to look up to. And where you don't believe that after your prayer in the morning or your prayer in the afternoon, if you took an action, it will result in what you have hoped for, you go to a prophet hoping for a miracle. That mindset is not different from that hope that a political party, once it promises a certain agenda, will deliver it and it will make you rich. It's not different from it. It's, it's a mental thing that we have. We are not confident people. Mm. That is what makes some people believe that, quote and unquote, the white man is better. It's the same mindset. It is that same mindset that makes people believe that I don't have the capacity and I must constantly, constantly be learning. It is that lack of self-confidence to do that makes us the best planners, perhaps, on the African continent, but never, never implementing. Everybody knows that. We never implement anything. Because at each point, we believe we are lacking something that we must. So taking that bold step is just not there. I'm a strong believer that one of the things that will help this government, and any government for that matter, I said this in 2009 in a, a lecture I gave called The Seven Lamentations of the Ordinary Ghanaian. It was an, on an Imani platform. And I did say, that I'm looking for the government that will set up an implementation committee whose sole goal is to make sure that government projects get delivered. And, and, and let me relate it to the public sector. You will see that we may have grandiose ideas and we keep setting up steering committees at various layers and each person wants to be on the steering committee and go and give reports and all the rest. But the doing is not there. You don't have a clear list where somebody is whipped for not delivering this at this time at this hour and get punished for it. If you want to do that, some, uh, some relative will call you, etc. Mm -hmm. That's part of our attitude that we need to deal with. The core of the problem is our attitude and mindset. If we can address that, two other things will follow. And, and, and we can talk about those two other things. But this is very basic. And left to me alone, uh, you uh, people in the media should spend half of your time talking about that and reduce the politics. Mm, interesting. Um, I hear you loud and clear on uh, reducing the politics, and I'm all for you know, thought leadership and getting people 
um, to act positively and, and, and get the things they need to do done. But if we have to work on the mindset of the people, what are some of the critical things that we have to do? Not just the media, but what are some of the critical steps uh, or success factors that we have to consider? I've talked about confidence as basic. And who are confident people? A confident people are those who pick up a program and believe they have the capacity to deliver it. If they don't have the capacity to deliver it, they will borrow that capacity. But if you borrow that capacity, you understand that you are learning for a period and you will take over. One of my clients was in my office recently and he was giving me rather a very sad story. He's a big industrialist. He brought a Chinese engineer here who installed a particular uh, plant in the factory, trained people for four years, and when the Chinese left and a certain part of the equipment broke down, the people came to him and said, can you bring the Chinese back? That's an example of... After four years of yes, training? Yes, yes, yes. This is real story I'm talking about last week. And he's like... David, what is wrong with our people? And I said, we have to admit that half of our people are not hardworking. I don't want to use the word lazy. We cannot catch up with the rest of the world with the level of mentality we have on an eight to five mentality. If people are already ahead of you, the way to catch up with them is to work extra. And when I say extra, I don't mean that you are working nonstop, no. I mean understanding that you need to develop the strategies that enable you to catch up. And those strategies means taking the responsibility upon yourself. If you brought a Chinese here, learn the skills and take over. Take VRE as an example. VRE was developed by Kaiser. After three years or so, the Ghanaians took over and have managed it to this day. So if you can manage VRE as complex as it is, and in fact, at some point, it was ranked as the second best managed hydro plant in the world, next to only one in California. And VRA's credit rating was so high that it could actually stand in for the government when the government borrowed money, way up to the 80s or so. Why can't we do it in other spheres? Because of this lack of confidence, when it comes to innovating, we innovate in the wrong areas, and we think that's where our innovation ends. I mean, at, at the recent CEO forum, I showed the picture, and I, and I was challenging this thought uh, of people who think Ghanaians are not innovative. And I said, we are very, very innovative. We are not confident in our innovation. We think we cannot do it. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Now, we do have people who have some potents like uh, Fufu pounding machine. Some I understand they call it a, a, a they have, it has some Chinese name mm -hmm. uh, uh, these days. They have people who invented Fufu pounding machine at KNUST two decades back. That's true. We don't have a program where governments reward people for simple inventions, for simple innovations, and make it a national news and encourage people to back them. Those are the things which you, because once you achieve something and you are praised, it gives you the next level of confidence to move on and on. Because we don't have that strategic goal to create a confident people, the innovation we have are only things which are peculiar to our culture. That's why we have a very, very innovative funeral industry. It's the most innovative industry. I mean, I showed a picture at the CEO forum and I showed three people, quote and unquote, standing, and I asked the whole crowd, how many people do you see? And everybody said three. And I said, no, there are two human beings. The other one is a corpse. This was a third person who died. And we are so innovative, we make the corpse stand. There are people who do this so-called dancing cops. I keep talking about it. Our innovation in the funeral industry is so advanced that when anybody dies, we inform the president. Every sub-chief dies, we go to the president to tell him. And I'm not talking about Nana Kufado. President after president. That's an innovation of a people. Why don't we practice this innovation in engineering? Go to Ashesi, I heard you on radio talking to Ashesi students this morning. There are people who are doing robotics. Why are we not bringing them to the fore? Why are we not celebrating them every Friday? Why are we not celebrating them every month and say the, the innovation of the, of, the, of, of, of the month? There are many of these people. When you do that and you can focus on the fact that these are things are being done here, by its very nature, the confidence will begin. So, so that's for the private sector side. And there are various trends that, I mean, on a short program like this, we cannot. But let me talk about the public sector. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I believe that we need to begin to address our psyche as a national, um, as a nation. Mm -hmm. And that psyche itself will address the confidence. And I talk about this principle of our branding. And maybe we can elaborate on that. But if we got our national branding right, 
I believe it will drive enough confidence both in the nation and in the people. Please expand on branding. I'm very, very excited when I hear the word brand or branding. We have a brand Ghana office. I had occasion to speak to one of the members of the brand Ghana team, uh, Nana Atudazi specifically, a couple of years ago, and told him what I think my view of the brand was. Uh, the conversation didn't go far. It was in person. Uh, I don't know whether it was carried forward uh, or not. But let's look at brand as it is. It is one of the most difficult things to define. But you and I do know that a brand is about what you feel. So people will talk about Joy FM, mm -hmm. and at times they even forget it's called multimedia. Because that is the name that people know. But what is it the name which is the brand? No, it is what people feel about Joy FM. And when you have a good brand, other things tend to be associated with it. So you may have a Dom FM, you may have other things, which suddenly people think, okay, if Joy FM is good, then probably this other one is good. So these come as brand attributes. Okay, that's for private sector. But a nation's brand mm -hmm. affects the brand of the corporate entity. And one of the things both politicians and businesses in Ghana seem to be forgetting, and we need to hate it, is that the growth in GDP is nothing more than a collection of our individual productivity. That's why a confident people is so important to me. Mm -hmm. If as individual corporate entities, if Joy FM doesn't grow, how does the nation grow? If, if Joy FM grows, then you count the growth in terms of number of people employed who are paying PAY, SNAID, etc. That's what ends up increasing the GDP collectively. Okay. So individual and corporate brands are good. That's but right. if the nation's brand is good, then we take our identity from it. And let's illustrate. If somebody brought you something made in Ghana, <coughs> Burkina Faso, China, and US or Germany, depending on what product, if it's a machine, the typical Ghanaian will say, oh, this one is made from uh, US. In fact, some Ghanaians actually call UK-made products homemade, whatever that is supposed to mean. I don't know if, whether you, if UK yeah. is their home and, and all that. <laughs> if it's a machine, they would, this one is a German machine. If it's a watch and it's made in Switzerland. So the nation's brand affects the products. That is why, as a nation, we must take care of our brand. Okay, now let's zero in. I know there was a brand Ghana office, and I know they were doing some research, etc. I don't know whether you know what Ghana's brand is. But way back through the 90s to about now, we came up with something called the gateway concept. Yeah. I don't know who originated that. It was originated under the, the Vision 2020. NBC, the Vision 2020, yes. 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 But, uh, but when I say I don't know who originated that, uh, I'm, being, I'm, I'm trying to, um, to see whose idea this was. Now, that gateway concept seems to have permeated the entire public service to this day. Even though, even though the gateway secretariat was collapsed long ago. Mm -hmm. Why is it a gateway? And why is the gateway concept so important? In fact, if you've seen the short video clips going on around now on the diaspora uh, summit, uh, uh, homecoming, That's they right. end with saying that Ghana, the gateway to West Africa, or why are we a gateway? And who pays attention to the gate? What does gate tell you in your mind if you talk about the gate? The Nigerians have said, for example, that you can be the gateway, you are the destination. I believe that Ghana has a natural brand. A brand is strong when it is true, when you don't have to fight hard about it. No. And it's important to be illustrated before I zero in on what I think our natural brand is. That's right. Singapore, the brand of Singapore is neatness. True. For many, many years it was neatness. And what did Singapore do to attain this neatness that drove everything else? I had the fortune of being in a room conference, sitting down, where Lin Kuan Yu gave close to two-hour interview. No holds bad. Every question was asked. So I had the fortune of seeing him in life. And he described how this niche test then started. And that he made the airport of Singapore so clean, sparkling clean, that when you landed at the airport, you forgot the rest of the country was not neat. He actually said that he realized that a human mind's perception is formed in two minutes. So whatever he found at the airport, he tended to associate the rest of the country. So once they made the airport very clean, the rest of the cleaning continued after the airport. And the Singapore brand of neatness was associated with the airport cleanliness. Of course, they became a place where ships going round from one side of the, the world to the other uh, uh, started using docking there, the captains flying there in to take over their ships, then dry dock started. We had a dry dock before they started. So, a brand could be as simple as neatness. 
And I tell people, Kelewele can be a brand. Shito can be a, a brand. Kente can be a brand. These are peculiar to Ghana. Jollof. Well, Jollof, I don't go in for Jollof because... It's contentious. It's contentious. Yeah. It's Nigeria, it's so uh, Senegal, and, and Liberia. Now, Ghana is the center of the world. It is. There's no dispute about that. And that's our brand. And anybody who is at the center, who chooses to call himself a gate, has a problem. He, he's not confident enough to tell himself that he's a center. Let me land on this, because a very, very important brand we are missing. Mm -hmm. And I have done research on this, spoken to people. People have talked about this, and I don't know why we are not bold to claim that which is ours. The zero degrees goes through Ghana. It is the last land it enters before it goes all the way to the Antarctica. There's no other land there for the zero degrees. I have visited this place. I've taken pictures there. There are ships, which to this day, come off the shore of Tema, land and perform ceremonies because it's the last land where you can be in the east and western hemisphere at the same time. This is real. This is not a joke. Four or five years ago, when some of us kept pushing this, Tema Municipal Assembly and the Tema uh, Paramountcy started something they call the Center of the World Festival. But it's not a Tema brand. It's a Ghana, it's a brand. Ghana brand. In the 60s, Kwame Nkrumah had a zero room in the Meridian Hotel. It's 1960. People paid money to go and sleep in the zero room because they were sleeping at the center of the world. The funny thing is today, if you take the GPS and go to that point for the zero room, it's about one degree off the actual, because now with advanced technology, mm -hmm. the spot is there, and I have gone there. Now let's, and, and this is the center between east and west, but I'm talking about center of the world. Mm -hmm. So let's deal with the equator. The equator is five degrees south of Ghana, exactly 676, 77 kilometers south of Ghana. The closest land to it, on the west is Gabon, which is 1,073 kilometers off. If you take the proximity of the intersection of the equator and the Greenwich Meridian, Ghana is the closest land. There's no other place. Yet, we cannot claim this simple thing. Now, the impact of this brand is huge. We are equidistant to the rest of the world. There's no doubt about that. And I, you can put the picture of the world map there and show it. And I can tell you the brand attributes I have outlined, and I'm, the only, the only, I'm not the only person who have talked about this. I gave a public lecture on this in 2015 at the British Council Hall. It was broadcast live on one of your radio stations. Recently, I met one of the people who were there, and he said, it looks like you said this at that time. But uh, I, I said, yes, I did. Go back and play the tape. But everybody, every single news media that day reported that I was recommending for the creation of a minister of business. Hmm. Yes, it was my recommendation. I promoted it. I went on TV, etc. Why do you think Ghanaians heard that and they never heard the center of the world? Because our cultural nuances allow us to focus on that which somebody else can do. We need a politician to set up a minister for business for businesses to grow. So the brand attributes of a center of the world, where you can actually create a product and say this is made at the center of the world, which you can do for ourselves, is lacking because we are not confident people to claim it. Hmm. We're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, David, we're going to explore the brand concept a little further, uh, and uh, we'll also learn a little about tomorrow. When I say tomorrow, the youth. Uh, succession planning is big uh, on your agenda. Uh, we'll explore what we need to do to ensure that this brand, if created, can be harnessed and managed by the young people uh, who will run it in the future. This is the Executive Lounge with me, Sharada. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge, and uh, we've been learning quite a lot from David Ofosudote, senior partner at ABN David. David, you talked about branding. Now, the Ghanaian brand, if we were to harness this center of the world brand, what are some of the low-hanging fruits that we can leverage this on? There are quite many. Uh, there are two ways to do it, and, and I like as to, because I also talk about a mindset and confident people, you know, we must, we, we must make this thing so simple because the, once we get the thing moving, other attributes will follow. So because of that, let's focus on just two sectors, the private sector as a broad one and the public sector as one. Now, today, nothing, absolutely nothing, stops Joy FM from calling itself the radio station at the center of the world, nothing. 
Nothing stops anybody from organizing charter flights to come to Ghana, go to Tema, and walk by the wall and go to the zero degree point. Absolutely nothing. Nothing stops anybody who manufactures in Tema from branding his product made at the center of the world. Nothing stops anybody from making a proposal to Ghana Highway Authority and say that if you are driving from Tema to Aflao, from Kintampo to, uh, no, from uh, Techiman to Tamale, from Accra to Akosombo to Aflao, on each of these points, the zero degrees go through. You can put stops there, create amusements around them, put a signboard, you are entering the Eastern Hemisphere, you are entering the Western Hemisphere, you are leaving the Western Hemisphere, you can stand on the zero degrees. The Tema Golf Course is one of the only seven golf courses in the world where you can play golf on the zero degrees. Nothing stops any businessman from doing that. Of the zero degrees in Tema Port, we have the Ramsaya site, which is a bird watching site. It's a site that certain birds come once a year, and that's the only place. People fly from all over the world to come there. Nothing stops us, stops any hotelier from creating a zero room and let people go and stay there and experience it. Nothing stops anybody today from organizing a cruise from anywhere to Tema Harbor to experience the zero degrees. That's purely private sector. But because we are not a confident people, we are waiting for government to do something. That's the problem. And now the public sector is also waiting for politicians to do something. And the politician is actually waiting for the people to push them. So everyone's waiting. Everybody's waiting for everybody. Now, so the private sector can do a lot of things with that particular brand. And it's important because, because it is such a unique brand and it's based on location, location, location. Everybody can use it. Let me deal with the public sector. The public sector needs on, to make only one intervention and nothing more. Mm. That intervention is the specific zero point at Tema Harbor now. Okay. And some of us have been advocating for this for years. There's a gentleman called Azongo Simpe who has been talking about this for years. Now, if the government can ensure that the developers or those refurbishing Tema Harbor can allocate a certain part, and you may find it pathetic, but containers are being put on that line now. We are not marrying ecotourism eco into that development. So let's be deal with the government part. If the government can ensure that a certain square area is actually made available, there are a number of things that can be done there. There are those who want to set up research places there, scientists who will be ready to do research at that particular center because the determination of time zone in the world, the Greenwich Meridian determines how, how time is determined. That's a fact. And we sit on a GMT, which never changes. Yes, that GMT is called Monrovia time or Casablanca, mm -hmm. if you've checked. That's true. Tema is not mentioned, yeah. but that's why the zero degree ends. And the time is called GMT Greenwich Meridian. Greenwich is very far away. Mm -hmm. Because we've not pronounced and claimed the brand, other people have claimed it. Not even in sense of time have we claimed it. So if the government can make that claim, scientists will use it, geographers will need it. What about tourism? The impact on tourism is untold. And there are a lot of products that can come. Look, the Presby Church in Tema. Yes. Was visited by the Queen and her husband in her last visit to Ghana, I think 1999. It was in 1999, yes. yes. Because the Presby Church sits on the zero degrees. And there's a marking there. Since Africa has all these prophets, do you understand what worshipping at the zero degrees will mean? Do you appreciate if you built a cathedral and incorporated it in it and made it an interfaith place to pray? And do you know the number of charter flights that we can fly? Kotoka will then become a hub, true hub. And you can have a direct, even vessels which are cruising from Accra to the zero degree point. The impact of this is huge. It needs a bold people. So I'm talking about it from two angles. Either the government will take that step or the people should take that step. Mm. Because in this world, if the people take that step, the government will actually grab and realize that a movement of the people and they will follow. By the way, I haven't had the chance to talk to the current government about this. But I've given public lectures. About a month or two ago, I had occasion to speak to the chief executive of the Ghana Tourist Development Co Company about it. I met him again two weeks ago and I said, pick this idea up, talk to the minister. I'm ready to explain to her or to him. I've not had the chance. Hopefully I will. Hopefully those of you in the media can push it. I don't claim this as owning it. I believe the conversation in this country must change. And if it changes and we focus on our brand, all of us can benefit from that brand.
So it's out there in the public. Let us ensure that we, the private sector people, who start using it. And the government, like I'm saying, the only thing the government has to do is to make that intervention a, at that specific point. That point. Nothing more. The rest can be done by the private sector. Fabulous stuff. So we hypothetically jump on this and overnight we get this going. Uh, we have a population uh, where between 15, the age, ages 15 and 59, 63% of that class have had no or very little basic education. Will we be able to sustain the gains from some of these things that uh, we would get if we got our brand and the confidence that we need right? I think the answer is yes. I mean, no society starts with the entire people. But no society succeeds when the entire people are not part. So every single thing that the government is doing is when the entire people become a part of. We are a very polarized society. Nobody has to deceive himself about that. So if you talk, for example, about one district, one factory, half the country may say, ah, this is an MPP policy. Another half may say, well, this is an uh, NDC has a better policy, etc." You and I should not be interested in that. Mm -hmm. If one district, one factory is good for us, are the people in Ghana confident enough and picking it up? I had occasion, and I think you were there when I asked the question. How many people, how have, many read people the policy? have read the policy? <laughs> and only one hand shot up. I was frightened. I was talking to chief executives. If you have not understood the and I asked how many people have read the manifesto, how do you take advantage of it? So if you don't take, uh, as a result of that lack of confidence, foreigners will bring proposals, and then we go seek for local content. What about local initiated? which leads to a growth in the local content. That's why I'm saying that with this particular idea, you don't need to wait for government. Mm -hmm. You can do it now. Anybody at all can pick it. So illiteracy does not really affect it because a few literate who understand branding, people like you, will say, yeah, you are making this fine shoe, but this fine shoe can be branded in a particular way. But we don't have to stamp center of the world on everything. No. Look, the biggest advantage of the center of the world policy is a logistics hub. A country which is equidistant from the rest of the world is a natural logistics hub. Mm -hmm. What that means is that if you create a logistics center, you can have several free zones within Ghana. People will put industries here. The Chinese, instead of Ghana, say will put factories here because they can fly it to anywhere in the world. And bring the massive ships exactly. and create industries. Because you can create industries here, it will employ the people who are not so literate. We can do adult, adult education, transfer skills to them. We have a magazine. These people you are talking about as not being so literate are the ones who are in magazine and are producing the, 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 the machinery and doing products fantastic and doing a fantastic job. Yeah. If we create that brand which enables people coming and pay attention to this world, there are simple adverts. And I can just show you just simple, one simple advert I would create if I was in charge of brand Ghana. It's a very simple advert. Go on. Why are you going to the moon when you haven't been to the center of the world? Mm. It's a very simple advert. When the future comes, when the world moves to the center, will you have a stake in it? That attraction mentally forces people to look at us. And it forces industries to consider their location. So it's not a simple brand. It's a powerful brand that drives feeling that we must take account of. And it will deal with the illiteracy. They will also be employed. Then we will have enough money to implement free SHS. As we wrap up, David, I'd like you to share with us what values drive you. I, I can tell a lot of conviction and passion, but what values really drive you? I think more in terms of principles and values. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are values, but I, I live by those principles and I don't joke with them. One of them is what Malcolm Gladwell has called the Matthew effect. It is that simple principle, I think it's in Matthew chapter 24, verse uh, 29, or no, 24, 25, or whatever. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's in Matthew, the book of Matthew, yeah. either chapter 24 or 25, where Jesus gave the parable and simply said that, unto him who has, more shall be given. The but parable unto, of the talents. Yes, Matthew but unto 25. him who has not, even that little shall be taken away from. I can write books on this. I live by that principle and several other principles. But why is that important? Because in the world, everybody has... The problem with us is that we think we don't have. Because we think we don't have, we keep looking. We don't have capacity. We are looking. We don't have money. We are borrowing from the World Bank. Let me give you an example, and I hope you have time. This will shock you. Mm -hmm. In November 2015, when I addressed corporate Ghana at, at a, a British Council, the first people I attacked are those who invited me. It took them months to organize that public lecture because they were looking for money from Busak. And I said, how do businessmen want to give a talk and they are inviting Busak to pay for that talk? 
they cannot dip their money into their pocket. How different are you when the government takes a bowl in its hand and go to the World Bank, America, UK, looking for money? It's our mentality. That's who we are. That's our psyche. You're not different people. So because that principle of he who has has more, once you recognize you have, and you start working with what you have, the rest is added. Attributes come in. If you don't recognize, and so is an individual, so is a nation. If you don't recognize that attribute that you have, you may have gold, the Chinese will pick it and mm -hmm. export 7 billion. Because we always think we don't have. We are looking for elsewhere when we already have. It's really, really important that we understand we have. If nothing at all, God plays us right at the center. And that must that be a very good reason. That cannot be disputed and there must be a good reason. At least, if nothing at all, do simple flyers. I live in the center of the world and I'm a proud Ghanaian. Mm. That you have. A lot can be added. Fantastic. What do you do to relax? Ah, big question. This is relaxation for me, actually. <laughs> it, it will surprise you. When I, I actually say the things I really believe in, I don't talk about things I don't believe in. I, I say things I believe in. I believe in it. I live it. It relaxes me. Mm. Other than that, the beach. I know almost every beach spot in Ghana. Wow. I drive to the beach at times. I, I relax. Or having a drink with friends. Uh, it changes everything for me. So generally that's about it. And I think walking, I, I do walk uh, every now and then. I do okay. my six kilometers, 10 kilometers on weekends and I'm fine. That's great. Yeah. Well, David, let's see. There's a lot we can talk about, uh, but I'd like to say a big thank you uh, for availing yourself and uh, just uh, downloading so much uh, knowledge. And hopefully the right people would hear it and we can do something with it. Thank you. But I am proud to be from the center of the world. And thank thanks you. for that revelation. Well, we have a tradition. We we'll sum up everything we've learned uh, in five points. Uh, and for me, the first thing is this, that um, you must be confident. You must develop a sense of confidence because if you're here, then you have the right to be here. And being here and having the right to be here means you should never feel that you're inadequate. Number two is that um, always look at the status quo and change it. Don't be coward into saying that others have and I don't. Always believe that you can do something different and do more than you've ever done. And the third thing that I've picked up and I'm taking away from this conversation is that as the world evolves, it's important that you look at what you can call your competitive advantage and hold on to that. After all, no one's going to celebrate you for where you're not strong. It is your strength that would differentiate you. And if we are from the center of the world, it's about time we started making use of that. And number four, a sense of responsibility. As David said, those who have, there's more expected of you. So if we have life, there's an expectation of us to do something with that life. So a sense of responsibility is critical for you to make an impact. And final and most important thing for me today is be bold. Never be afraid. If you don't do it, Come 24 hours, you would be where you are. So you have a choice that in the next 24 hours, you're either going to be where you are or you're going to be better off. The choice is yours. Thank you once again, David. Thank and you. my name is Inshirado. Again, thanks to the folk at Villa Monticello, to the entire crew, and my producer, Kukwa Apia. This has been the Executive Lounge. We'll be back again soon with more. Shalom. <laughs>